I'll be honest, when I first heard the term the 700 Club, I assumed that it was probably some fancy rich like yacht club or something, or like, I don't know, like a rich people club where a bunch of old men sat around smoke cigars and bragging about their boats or cars or whatever. And honestly, I wish I was right. And you're never too dead for resurrection. Instead, the 700 Club is partly responsible for the rise in religion mixing with politics. And don't get me wrong, religion and politics have always mixed even when they aren't supposed to. Like, we do have separation of church and state, but pretending it works perfectly is like saying that murder doesn't exist because it's illegal. Unfortunately, this club probably does far more damage than an occasional tax-exempt multi-million dollar megachurch with a stupidly rich pastor. I'm looking at you, Joel Osteen. And that's because the things that this club spouts are downright horrific. At the pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians who are actively trying to make that an alternative lifestyle, the ACLU, People for the American Way, all of them who tried to secularize America, I point the thing in their face and say, you helped this happen. Why, well, I, I totally concur. The clip you just heard featured Pat Robertson, founder of The 700 Club and televangelist Jerry Falwell, saying that gay people, feminists, abortionists, and paganists need to take responsibility. And for what, you might ask? 9-11, and I'm absolutely serious. They believe with all their empty, cold little money-grubbing hearts that gay people should take responsibility for an act of terrorism. And these are people that influence others. Pat Robertson also has a law degree from Yale. So on paper, he absolutely seems like a smart guy. He also attempted to run for president. He founded a university and he also founded something called the Christian Coalition. And that's an influential conservative political organization and he served as its head for decades. It isn't just one offensive comment from time to time either, just for the record. I wouldn't really be nitpicking if it was like something that they said maybe like once a decade. Robertson has apparently made a habit of showing his true colors on air for the world to see over and over and over again. They have been cursed by, by one thing after the other. Years later in 2010, he said that the earthquake in Haiti was divine retribution for a pact with the devil made by enslaved black people seeking liberation from French rule. I would prefer not to repeat that, even though I think I should because it is so goddamn bizarre and I don't think I know the correct words how to identify how messed up this is. But to clarify all the same, enslaved black people, according to Robertson, made a pact with the devil in the late 18th century to be liberated from the French. And that's why centuries later, they have apparently been cursed with earthquakes and poverty. Robertson didn't deserve the thoughtful but firm and respectful response that Haitians gave him, in my opinion. They could have said a lot more and maybe not been as polite, but I understand the whole politicking and how to phrase things on a global platform. Yet Pat Robertson has become far more than a Christian leader and pastor. He is undoubtedly a political figure and influencer to his followers. While researching this episode, there happened to be a live stream for the 700 Club, so I just happened to be there right time, right place, I guess. So I popped in and among the biblical Q&A questions, people also asked if the US dollar fell and what would replace it if it did. Pat says he believed that it will be quote, Chinese currency. So how deep does Robertson's influence go? What else is in the 700 Club? Well, that's what we're gonna find out here on today's episode of The Corporate Casket. And if you wanna find out even more information about some of your favorite episodes, future up and coming episodes, ad free episodes, and even bonus episodes that might just be a little too spicy for YouTube and Spotify, make sure to check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash Illuminati. Next week, we're coming up on a dark dive about the Cuomo dynasty. That was a suggestion from one of the patrons over in our private discord server, which y'all are a very wholesome group. We also have another live Q and A chat coming up at the end of the month. And we're gonna be doing a very interesting dive on a company that I didn't know a lot about, but I had to learn a lot about called Bad Dragon. Uh, it's way too hot for YouTube because it's very, very damn explicit. And uh, so it's gonna be over on patreon.com. Feel free to check it out. Love to chat with you over there. Pat Robertson was born into politics. His dad, Absalom Willis, served in the US House of Representatives and the Senate. But one might say that ministry was in his blood. Absalom's father, Franklin Pierce, was a Baptist minister. Pat, in turn, was basically the combination of his father and his grandfather. 
a minister that had political goals and political connections. Basically, think old Southern money and you're going to be on the right track for what this family kind of shaped up and looked like. When you turn on the 700 Club, you're watching a program that has been on the air continuously since 1966. It's one of the longest running daily programs in television history. Of course, Pat didn't just start the 700 Club, but the CBN or Christian Broadcasting Network. The 700 Club was just his primary talk show on there. And the thing is, I know that this may come as a shock to everyone, but I'm not actually against having a Christian television network. I don't really care what religion you are or what faith you are or what you practice or believe or don't believe in, you do you. However, the only counter that I have is that you do you as long as you and your beliefs do not hurt others. And that's the issue that I have with Pat here. It's not about him creating CBN itself. It's about what that network stands for. As an example, you can see in the 50 year history of CBN episode that they feature someone from the ACLJ or the American Center for Law and Justice. Though they might preach about freedom and liberty, the ACLJ is nothing more than a right-wing version of the ACLU and a propaganda machine for Trump. In my opinion, anyway, that's not fact. That is just my opinion because I see some correlations there. But we can go ahead and say that it is kind of like the right-wing version of the ACLU. Seeing as they actively fight against freedoms for LGBTQ plus people, I find it kind of disgusting Kind of disgusting. I find it very disgusting and hypocritical that they can say they're all for freedom of the American people, just unless you don't believe in their beliefs, of course. They're alleged to have a severely flawed governance and transparency issue, large amounts of money raised by them, and another Christian charity called CASE, just literally C-A-S-E, allegedly go toward the chief's counsel family and the chief counsel himself, Jay Sekulow, and he has close ties to former President Trump. So go ahead and remind me why that's a history you'd want to be proud of. And sure, you might say that, hey, this is pretty typical for religious organizations, unfortunately. We often see them claiming to love rights while actively trying to strip people of color and the LGBTQ community of their rights. But Pat Robertson takes it just one more step further. He doesn't seem to want separation of church and state whatsoever, even going so far as to call anyone who isn't a Christian a termite. And yeah, that absolutely sounds loving and godly and tolerant, right? His exact words were actually this, so here's a quote. The great builders of our nation have been Christians because Christians have the desire to build something. He is motivated by love of man and God, so he builds. The people who have come into our institutions today are primarily termites. They are into destroying institutions that have been built by Christians, whether it is universities, governments, our own traditions. The termites are in charge now, and that is not the way it ought to be. And the time has arrived for a godly fumigation. And if we just did the most basic of historical fact checks on our founding fathers of the United States of America, you would find out that they were most certainly not all Christians. In fact, most were not Christian at all. Truthfully, it's a horrifying twisting of the facts and there's no other word for it. He absolutely puts his money where his mouth is promoting the ACLJ, so I will at least give him that much. He does believe in it and he does put his money exactly where he says he you know, spouts his values from. Oh, but hey, maybe this is just an exaggeration. It's not as if Pat and his followers are literally rounding up non-Christians and using bug spray on them. That would be absolutely ridiculous and kind of comical, also potentially very deadly too. But he has called for acts of terrorism before, saying that a small nuke thrown off on foggy bottom might improve foreign policy. What a statement. Because yeah, we love to see an angry, violent leader within a community that calls everyone who disagrees with him a termite also talk about just throwing a small nuke. I don't know the difference between a large nuke or a small nuke, but I know a nuke is a nuke and that is all bad. Especially might I add when he says that Haitians made a deal with the devil for fighting slavery. Don't forget that either, that, that, that should still very much upset you. But this is the foundation that we have to work from here. These are the extremist beliefs that Pat Robertson brought to CBN and in turn, the 700 Club. So let's go ahead and take a look at what exactly he made of it, shall we? If the foundation of the CBN was made on such shaky grounds, I'm sure you can imagine that the 700 Club wasn't exactly much better. Their name is based on a fundraiser they once held to keep the channel going. Pat said they needed 700 viewers to donate $10 a month and said faithful viewers were called the 700 Club. 
So that's kind of where the name originates from, just so you know. But moving on, I'll give you a few guesses as to who originally hosted the show. And no, it wasn't actually Pat himself. So try again. Think of the televangelists we've talked about in previous episodes, just not Joel Osteen either. And if you guessed Jim Baker, you're correct. And yes, I, I know from that episode, I called him Jim Backer. I looked it up and the and I looked up like the phonetic definition of Backer and or of Baker and everything said Backer because it was like a Finnish word or something like that. And I just, anyway, I, I'm an idiot, so I messed up there. But um, yeah, if you guessed Jim Baker, you would be correct. Of all people, our old friend Jimmy Boy was actually the original host of the 700 Club back in the good old days. Considering that the Bakers literally have their own episode here, I'm not about to go into too much detail as to how messed up they are. Jim especially became one of the biggest televangelists out there, paving the way for more modern ones, such as Joel Osteen, and effectively helping propel the silver tongue prosperity gospel message into the mainstream. Jim didn't just work for Robertson's program. They were also close friends, apparently. Former CBN staff has said that Robertson was basically a surrogate father to Baker. According to the Washington Post, Robertson's biography, quote, quotes one former CBN executive who says he prepared for an internal report for Robertson that documented abuses and high living by the Bakers. A report, a copy of which apparently no longer exists, triggered major conflicts within CBN and led to reprimands for the Bakers just before they left the network in 1972, the book says. Basically, the Bakers were bad news long before they got their own show and became infamous on a whole new level. Robertson was made aware of this, allegedly, and did nothing to stop them. Instead, they just parted ways, and when the Bakers were eventually disgraced, Robertson denied ever being so close to them at all. After all, he had large political goals and ran for president shortly afterwards, so he was better off abandoning someone with that kind of scandal attached to them. I think at this point, I've made it fairly clear that I don't really respect people who try to downplay their relationship with someone controversial because they just want to look good. When I talked about Oprah, for example, I mentioned how she effectively built monsters with Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz. The shit these so-called doctors have done with their platforms is pretty disgraceful. And if Oprah didn't approve of it, I think it's on her to speak out and denounce them to her audience. But instead, she's co-signed the behavior. If Robertson had stepped up and said, yeah, he gave Baker a platform and regrets doing so, then he might still have a shred of integrity left in my book. Instead, his very literal book, he tries to paint himself as this deep person, far different than Baker, but never actually says, yeah, I regret being friends with him, it was a mistake. The author of his biography, who interviewed Robertson and his associates for more than 45 hours, even admits that one of the purposes of the book is to, quote, illustrate the dramatic contrast between Baker and Robertson, going on to add that the similarities in their ministries are only superficial. And truthfully, I just disagree. I don't see them as all that different. Even superficially, they look pretty much the same to me at surface level. Robertson hasn't had a financial scandal and downfall the way that Baker has, but you can't really tell me he didn't co-sign Baker either. The Washington Post writes, quote, Pat can remember us any way he wants, said Tammy Baker earlier this week. He's just getting on the bandwagon. In an emotional telephone interview, she described Robertson as a fair weather friend who never gave her husband the credit he deserved for helping build CBN. Almost every penny that was raised for CBN was raised by Jim, she said. Pat would let Jim do the telethon by himself and show up once in a while. The Bakers built the 700 Club and CBN right along with Robertson. And whether or not he hasn't given them enough credit or hasn't discredited their actions to his audience, neither is really a good look. I've watched some of the older 700 Club episodes too, like some of the oldest I could find anyway. And I don't think it's a legacy to be proud of regardless of who's actually hosting. For one, they are absolutely chock full of advertisements from everything from Christian films to Omega fish oil. And seriously, I listened to something like almost 20 minutes of ads before CBN News spoke about how they traveled to a beautiful place in Jerusalem that may or may not be the location of Jesus's tomb. I couldn't even see the footage because the screen was stuck on advertising Arctic Wonder Omega fish oil, while Pat, ironically, talked about how people sold merchandise in that area with disdain in his voice. I just love how it cuts to a Bare Minerals makeup ad right after about a minute's worth of contribution too. Like, just remind me again how this is supposed to be inspiring. Like, don't get me wrong here. Any television station is to an extent, one way or another, obviously out to make a profit, but there's something weird about CBN doing it in this way and with so many ads. Now, the thing is, I do think CBN and the 700 Club actually does have the potential to do good if they wanted to. Like in one article by Jennifer Wishin, CBN takes clips of law professors and sociologists and former inmates talking about the danger of private prisons. They discuss how these prisons treat people as commodities and look at it through a biblical lens, stating that Jesus never wrote anybody off. 
If we truly have a goal of redemption in mind, then private prisons are not the right way to go about this. And I agree with them there. And seriously, I do. The thing is like, if you want to talk about giving people a second chance, yes, treating them as products, as commodities within the private prison system, it's not the way to do that. The attitude in the article is actually a healthy one, but in my opinion, we see so little of this type of attitude. It just isn't their norm. And if it was, perhaps I wouldn't be so critical. Now, unfortunately, there is a lot more to the 700 Club than meets the eye. There's also that whole running for president and influencing politics bit too that we haven't even touched on yet. CBN, as well as the 700 Club, were a massive force in the pro-Trump TV media around 2017. Their newest political program at the time called Faith Nation airs on Facebook and it's geared towards a younger audience. This is basically CBN trying to draw in kids that are on social media, even though they clearly don't understand much about social media themselves. I'm pretty sure switching to TikTok would have been more effective, but I'm not going to give them tips. And if anyone remembers like early TikTok, like 2008, 2009 TikTok, like before the pandemic, when that shit was absolutely crazy, that was a, that was a time to be on TikTok. Now it's, I don't know, it's a little more structured. I, I liked it when it was kind of the Wild West. Anyway, but the point of all of this is to say that Robertson had a very wide reach. He's actually interviewed Trump many times now, and also one of Trump's lawyers on the Russia scandal was none other than Jay Sekulow. Remember him from earlier? I just briefly touched on him. He's the chief counsel of the right-wing version of the ACLU called the ACLJ. Like seriously, they weren't even creative enough to think of really a new acronym. That's literally one letter off, but okay. Anyway, this tie into politics is pretty dangerous all around. Not because I don't think Christians or anyone religious can't be involved in politics in the first place, but when you let religion cloud your judgment, then we're going to have a bit of a problem. There's supposed to be a separation of church and state for a reason, but folks like Pat Robertson and those around him really don't care about that. He was actually fined for things like this too. When Pat decided to run for president in 1988, he used the CBN to his advantage. Apparently, he used the tax exempt nature of his show to accept donations for his nomination, as much as $8.5 million, might I add. And that's $8.5 million in 1988 money. For comparison, if you were to have $8.5 million of 1988 money and inflate that into today's 2023 money, that is $21,861,131. That's an insane amount of money. And yeah, that's also real great for someone running for president to avoid taxes because initially those donations were donated to the church or to the nonprofit organization. And therefore, even though they were political donations, uh, they were suddenly not taxable because it was religious. And uh, you know, little crazy loophole they did there, right? You would think that someone would be just a shred bit more careful in their campaigning than this, but I guess Pat has an awful lot of nerve or just very few brain cells to pull a stunt like this. But what was he actually like? What is Pat really all about when it comes to being a Republican? Those who have tried to understand Pat's theology have come to interesting conclusions. See, Pat does truly believe that we are close to the second coming of Jesus Christ, but he sees political chaos as a good thing because it, quote, helps to bring about the end of days. That would mean that allegedly, Pat is one of those people who really does actually like watching the world burn. Gays cause 9-11. God sent hurricanes to Disneyland for hosting LGBTQ plus days. The 2012 tornadoes in the Midwest were because people didn't pray enough. Gay people wore sharp rings to cut strangers and infect them with AIDS. All of those things I just said are things that Robertson has claimed, and I don't know if he's ridiculous or stupid enough to believe all of them, but he supposedly does not see them as bad things either. The world will end soon, and these are just the signs. But, um, you know, Pat's predictions, they haven't actually played out in the way he claims either. On the Hill, Pat said that after five years of incredible peace under Trump and two attempts on his life, an asteroid will hit Earth and maybe finally bring an end. Okay, so maybe Pat Robertson is just a bit off the mark when it comes to the world going up in flames, but it's totally going to end soon and making harmful outlandish claims is a good thing for that, right? See, I find it incredibly ironic because if he actually believed peace was needed for the second coming of Christ, why also make inflammatory statements to try to take people's rights away? It also doesn't sound very peaceful to me. Nonetheless, Pat has changed both television and politics, whether we like it or not. He announced he was retiring as host of the 700 Club in late 2021, but after over half a century on the air, religion and politics say that few have done more to mobilize conservative Christians in the political realm than him. 
he's in large part responsible for the very reason why evangelical is a term that we typically associate with the Republican Party now. Leah Payne, an associate professor of theology at George Fox University, has even gone so far as to call the Trump presidency a, quote, triumph of Robertson's life and work, end quote. Personally, I never thought I'd be using triumph and Trump's presidency in the same sentence, but for Robertson, it truly is. It's the culmination of everything he stands for. It's not as if the ideal political climate was created by Trump overnight. Robertson acting behind the scenes and pushing the message of Christians voting Republican for decades moved things along more than we could ever realize. And maybe what we're just starting to realize now, if we're being honest. He had experience too. Robertson lost the presidential election in the 1980s because he wasn't able to shake off his televangelist persona and attract those leery of Pentecostalism. But when he lost, he kept pushing. He established the Christian coalition and started training members at the grassroots level to join local government boards. He built that climate we mentioned from the ground up. He gave the religious right an obscene amount of power in politics. And you've probably heard about now after the stolen election nonsense, Steve Bannon and other right wingers have called on Republicans to run at the local level and tried to take politics bit by bit, piece by piece. And that's exactly what this reminds me of, of what Robertson did just decades earlier. But maybe if you're truly about giving everyone the benefit of the doubt, you might even say that if Robertson crossed a line, it's possible he didn't know where the line was in the first place. We all get passionate about politics from time to time, right? The trouble is, according to his staff, Robertson was perfectly aware that what he did was shady. He just didn't care. And before we take a moment to discuss folks speaking out against Pat Robertson, we're gonna take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. Tired of the endless search for the perfect outfit? Well, Stitch Fix is here to help. Using their online platform and personal stylists, you'll have access to a custom wardrobe that fits your style and budget. Say goodbye to the stress of shopping and hello to the convenience of Stitch Fix. And that's because Stitch Fix is the easy way to get clothes that fit you without having to endlessly scroll through options. All you do is answer a few questions about where you typically get your clothing from, what you like to wear, your price range, and your sizes, and they will help you find perfect clothing picked just for you. I've been using Stitch Fix for years at this point. You guys may know at this point, it's almost a running joke about the whole sweater thing. I love sweaters. I wear sweaters all the time, all season, all year, forever. And Stitch Fix is one of my main suppliers of sweaters. That sounds a little shady, but it's, it's not. And they always seem to have just this great variety of clothing, though obviously I tune into sweaters and they listen to that. So I'm always seeing new sweaters pop up but they have so much more than sweaters. They have everything to cover you from head to toe, no matter where you go or what you need to be dressed up for. And right now, Stitch Fix is offering my listeners $20 off their first fix at stitchfix.com slash casket. That's stitchfix.com slash casket for $20 off your first box today. Again, stitchfix.com slash casket. Let's take a moment to check in with ourselves. How would you rate your relationship with yourself lately? Whether you're feeling confident and want to explore your innermost desires further, or maybe you could use a little boost in self-love. Dipsy is here to help either way. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. One of my favorite parts about Dipsy is the fact that they have sleep stories and wellness sessions, just something to help you kind of relax and take your mind away for a couple minutes after a really, really stressful day. And yeah, I'm not gonna ignore the other part. Dipsy absolutely has some amazing audio stories that are, you know, real hot and heavy and sexy and all sorts of different categories for you to explore. They also even have them in word form if you would prefer to read it. That's also totally cool and they have that for you too. But I really love putting a sleep story on and just literally knocking out and going to bed for the night. It works like a charm. So let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies or relax and unwind, or of course, maybe even heat things up with a partner. And for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com casket. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to dipseastories.com slash casket, dipsystories.com slash casket. Terry Heaton is the former producer of The 700 Club. And when he spoke out a few years ago, wow, it was, uh, it was telling, let me say. Like an absolute mess is an understatement, basically. According to him, the program turned the Bible into a self-help manual and no, that's not a compliment, even if he's not quick to insult Robertson either. Vox says that in Heaton's biography, he presents Robertson and his team as well-meaning idealists who wanted to bring people to Jesus. Those intentions over time, quote, morphed into a need to hold on to power for its own sake. Personally, I do find it really difficult to find Robertson and his associates all that well-meaning. 
it's possible that maybe they did start out that way, maybe, but when you preach to a wide audience that gay people caused hurricanes and other tragedies, maybe call me crazy here, but that just doesn't sound well-meaning at all, with or without the context. Maybe Robertson and those close to him weren't always hateful and bitter as they come across. Or maybe Heaton is keen on giving them a bit of an excuse considering that he worked alongside Robertson for years. I don't know the answer there and I don't think I'll ever know. Regardless, the negative things Heaton does have to say line up perfectly with what we do know about the prosperity gospel and televangelist attitudes, like how they warp the Bible into what Heaton refers to as the gospel of the self. It's not about being the word of God anymore, no. Instead, the parts of the Bible that Robertson and other televangelists like the most are the bits and pieces that say faith in God can bring earthly and spiritual reward. We've seen plenty of times how preachers like Baker and Falwell say that donating to God will do the same, even though, strangely enough, the money always does seem to end up in their wallets. To tack on to this, Heaton also claimed that the 700 Club really did put on a show in a very superficial and literal sense. This resulted in, quote, casting only conventionally attractive and successful looking Christians in their segments and exclusively focusing on the positive aspects of Christianity. This doesn't mean that there aren't successful Christians out there, but to only show one side of the story is a bit odd. It's a bit misleading and it's gross. And worst of all, it's unsurprising. And I know we've seen it all before, so what's new, right? But the important thing to recognize here is how CBN and the 700 Club were actually some of the first to do it. They didn't just inspire people like Baker, but they laid the groundwork for many, many televangelists in years to come in the way that they preached about the prosperity gospel. And they're probably still influencing future pastors that have yet to come up in popularity. Eaton even gave a specific example of this in an interview with Vox that I'll summarize here. Essentially, they created a segment that was meant to be a vehicle for Pat's teachings. A character would do something wrong so Pat could teach them. In one segment, a guy was losing money because he was trying to give his way out of debt. He gave away $100 and more money came his way so he could pay off his $1,000 debt since the Bible says you'll receive a hundredfold for what you give. This is actually tenfold, so I'm not sure if the math checks out, but I think you generally get the point here. Pat didn't like it because it didn't show prosperity and how everything was going to work out fine. It didn't fit in with his foundational teachings that you can always overcome the odds. Everything's always fine and dandy on CBN. While I don't think that Heaton is a perfect narrator here as he has his own biases, just as I have mine, seeing the way he speaks about his past on the 700 Club is pretty eye-opening. He claims that Pat even prayed God would kill the Supreme Court a while ago and they had to keep that from airing. He knows that Pat's relationship with Trump was dangerous and scary because it is. I shudder to think what Pat would have done if he actually became president. And truthfully, at the end of the day, I don't care what you believe politically or religiously. But if your religion advocates for stripping people of their basic human rights, then maybe that's something you need to take a look at with a slightly closer lens. But with all of that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I wanna thank you so much for making it to another episode. I know there's a million and a half things you could be doing in the world and yet you chose to spend a couple minutes here with me. So thank you. And as always, I am very appreciative and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.